Aeon for their sponsorship for this entire year. And uh, now I'd like to hand things over to Florence uh, for, for the webinar. Florence. Fantastic. Thank you, um, Steve. And uh, it's been great uh, working with the Forum for Workplace Inclusion. Uh, I was able to attend last year and found it fantastic. And uh, I was so excited about this webinar series. I said, Steve, please get me on it. So I'm really happy to be uh, ninth in the series. And um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, today, we are looking at diversity and inclusion uh, from uh, what's going on in Asia and also about engaging Asian talent. Uh, now, my Chinese is now being turned into Jibbuglyuk, as you can see on the screen, uh, but it should say there that, you know, this is community business and it has today's date. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So, uh, so uh, just to uh, show you what I look like on a good day, that's how I look. Uh, I am Florence Chan, Senior Manager for Programs and Development, working and training in consulting, research and special projects for community business. Uh, you can hear that I am from the UK, or some people may think I'm from Australia. <laughs> uh, I'm a qualified solicitor, lawyer, uh, experience in employment immigration law and I've helped contribute and write some of the research that we have at Community Business. I am also fluent in Cantonese um, and uh, I could say I have a business working capability for Mandarin too now. Um, next slide. Um, Community Business is a non-profit. We're a registered charity here in Hong Kong but we operate around the region uh, we've been operating for uh, over 15 years, uh, focusing on harnessing the power of business to drive social change. Um, so if you go into the next slide, we cover uh, key pillars, including building responsible leadership, investing in local communities, which is where our charity status comes in, tackling workplace inequality, which is where the majority of our diversity and inclusion work uh, falls under, uh, ensuring employee well-being, uh, talking about mental health, uh, well-being, uh, and things like work-life balance issues, and then promoting social inclusion. Uh, and that can uh, connect with things like uh, social mobility. Okay, so that's us in a the, in the whirlwind. Now, I want to do, I think, let's see if this works. I think we want to do a quick poll, Ben. Um, I might need your help here, which is the next slide. And then we have one more slide. Um, so asking you some questions about how much do you know about Asia? Um, and uh, let me see, uh, yes. Have you ever been to Asia? Uh, if you can click yes or no. Uh, does your company have any presence in Asia? That would be interesting to know. And as you are putting your answers for this, um, I want you to know that uh, you may have noticed that we have a special guest with us today, which is um, uh, which is uh, the lovely uh, Linda Akutagawa. And now she is going to help provide um, the perspective of Asian Americans, uh, which I don't have as I've, I've not lived and, 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 and spent time in the US. Um, and uh, one of the questions we would also like to find out is whether or not um, you are dialing into this webinar because you are interested in developing Asian talent that is based in the US or Asian talent that is based in Asia. So you're welcome to share your purpose, whether it's for Asian talent in Asia or Asian talent in US in the chat box because we, didn't, we haven't added that as a polling question. So I, Linda and I are both keen to see if, if the focus is on US or, or, or more on Asia in terms of developing Asian talent. So that'd be great to hear. Okay, so this is good to see the poll. It looks like it's 50-50 when it comes to have you been to Asia. So that's interesting. 
and I think I'm sure Linda and I will both take note of that. Uh, does your company have any presence in Asia? It's quite positive to see uh, slightly more is yes, uh, which is fantastic. Um, uh, and then there are some that don't, which is no problem at all. Uh, it's still important to engage your Asian talent and understand the Asian uh, clients uh, as well as key stakeholders that might be relevant to your business in some way or another. Okay, so thanks for that, Ben. Really appreciate it. Um, we can quickly skip the next slide and go into this one. Yes, fantastic. Okay, so I wanted to quickly say that, did you know if the world were 100 people, uh, that actually 60 would be, ama would be Asian? So uh, this shows uh, the sheer volume and diversity that exists within Asia and how we actually outnumber the rest of the world. And what do we mean by that? Well, we have a look at the next slide in terms of if the world were a village of 100 people. Looking at languages, most would assume that uh, English would be the, the most spoken, but actually it's Chinese. Uh, coming in second is Hindi, um, which is the majority uh, language spoken in India. And then coming in third is English, followed by Spanish and Russian at joint six. And now why, you know, why would Chinese be so high? Well, Chinese is actually not only spoken in China, it's spoken all across the region in many, many countries within Asia. And so to give you an insight, I will go into some country overviews. Um, also, um, going into the next slide, um, when we are talking about diversity in Asia, uh, this is something that uh, came, came, we came across recently with the, the huge hype about crazy rich Asians. Now, I wish you were all in the same room so I could see a show of hands to see who has seen this movie. I'm sure everyone or most people have seen this movie or have read one book or another from the series. And certainly I've, I've gone to see it myself. Fantastic movie and it's great representation of Asians. Um, and having a presence in Hollywood. However, you may be interested to know that in Asia, there was actually some backlash towards the representation of diversity of Asia in that film. And common social media posts like this one um, from Singapore was talking about how actually it really made people um, assume that Asians are just like that. They're just, they all look like Constance Wu. Um, East Asian, maybe Chinese, um, uh, Japanese, and that um, there were fingers pointed at how the other Asians uh, seem to be put in the background. And actually, darker Asians, such as the Indian ethnicity or Southeast Asian ethnicity, South Asian uh, communities were seen as the doormen, the guards, uh, and uh, helping them open the doors, as you can see in that image. And so it did kick up a whole debate of visibility of Asians and, and how the West or how the uh, people outside the region will see, you know, the, the, I, their idea of what an Asian is. Okay, so with that in mind, I want to quickly, I'm going to do this really quickly because I don't have that much time, because I do want to reserve at least 15 minutes for um, the lovely Linda to share about the Asian American perspective at the end. I'm going to go through some key markets that we community business cover talking about diversity demographics and inclusion so that you have an idea of the differences within Asia and in terms of ethnicities, in terms of religions, culture and perspectives and how actually um, we are not all um, the same. And this is something that actually um, struck me as uh, quite commonly felt when I visited the US last year talking to companies. Um, they didn't realize the diversity that exists within Asia and the diversity of people and cultures. Okay, so next slide. Thanks, Ben. First of all, Hong Kong. Hong Kong uh, is a uh, 
part of China, uh, but it operates on a one country, two systems. So we have separate systems. I'm based in Hong Kong. Uh, so we have separate legal systems, separate government, but we are um, connected to China as, as part of their country. Okay, uh, in terms of uh, key uh, diversity demographics, the ethnicity, the majority is Chinese, but we do have um, a substantial uh, Southeast Asian community. Uh, we also have uh, a good, uh, strong uh, expat community from overseas. Uh, and in terms of religion, we, uh, the majority is actually local religions such as Taoism, and Buddhism, and we have a lot of temples here, but we also have a very strong Christianity stronghold, um, which uh, has been embedded through the colonial times when the British occupied Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of schools and churches set up during that period and have been entrenched as um, leading, uh, leading um, authorities and organizations. Uh, in terms of languages, we speak Chinese, but it's not the same as mainland China. We speak Cantonese. Uh, it is a traditional form of the text. So even the text is different to China. Uh, it's more complicated. There's more brushstrokes. Um, and um, mainland China use the simplified version. Uh, there are actually dialects within Hong Kong because there are uh, villages and minority uh, eth uh, ethnic, well, uh, cultural minorities within Hong Kong and different villages and different um, uh, uh, um, backgrounds such as Hakka and Hokkien uh, that exist in Hong Kong as well. And in terms of the workforce statistics, good strong participation of the labour force as well as female participation. But in terms of women on boards, we are flagging behind uh, um, globally at 13.8 percent and there is a, uh, a good participation of Gen Y. Okay, next slide. In terms of key diversity and inclusion uh, topics, uh, there is a whole host of things here. I'm only going to cover a few very quickly because I have a lot of content to get through, uh, but you will get a copy of these slides and you can also contact me afterwards if you want to uh, you know, clarify things a bit more. Now, LGBT, there is limited recognition of same-sex marriage and limited legal protection. Why is that? Well, because this year uh, there was the decided case of QT, a lesbian couple uh, that are expat couple, won the right to same-sex dependent partner visas. And so this has opened the door to um, immigration um, gu guidance uh, and that enables same-sex partners, uh, provided they have valid documentation, such as a marriage certificate or civil partnership agreement uh, certificate, um, they can get dependent partner visa. And this is an officially recognized uh, route, uh, and it's the first, one of the first of its kind um, in the region. Limited legal protection, that is relating to um, transgender uh, community, because uh, for a transgender community, you can be diagnosed with gender dysphoria, which in turn entitles you to uh, a disability recognition, maybe uh, a disability card and so on, which means that you can have protections under disability discrimination ordinance. So there is no LGBT protections, but you can do it through that route, which is shocking, I know. Uh, there is active local LGBT community, tons of um, NGOs and, and local groups, and, and there's very public uh, and open debate, even on TV, on radio, in government, with um, an, uh, an openly gay politician in Hong Kong called Ray Chan. Uh, and then there is also the LGBT plus inclusion index, which a little plug is actually by community business. So we run an inclusion index for businesses, nonprofits, um, even consulates and chambers uh, every two years. So the next one's gonna be next year. In terms of gender, uh, the Women on Boards 30% Club is very active. That's something that's uh, global. Uh, paternity leave is a poultry three days, now five days. Maternity leave is only 10 weeks, statutorily, um, although recently announced increase to 14 weeks. But going through government, that could take two years. 
in terms of culture, it's an international city, but it does have an Asian, strong Asian heritage, good East meets West. There is a lack of integration between international and local staff. So it's kind of a us versus them when it comes to expats and the locals. Quite often this is the case of Western expats uh, versus the locals. Uh, and the Westerners are seen as having this more higher status. Uh, and that can cause conflict. Um, influx of mainland Chinese with the opening of the border uh, since Hong Kong was returned by the uh, British to China in 1997 causes conflict between mainland Chinese and Hong Kong. Again, another us versus, versus them kind of mentality. And then there's a lot of discrimination against ethnic minorities, particularly the Southeast Asian community. Um, Filipino, uh, Indonesian, these particular uh, countries are, have high rates of discrimination because there is also a strong helper culture. A lot of um, people from these countries go to Hong Kong to become domestic helpers. Uh, and there is this stereotype and um, bias towards people from that country, assuming that they are like these helpers and seen as lower skilled workers. Okay, next slide. China. Now for China, uh, in terms of the ethnic groups, uh, the majority is Han Chinese, so similar to Hong Kong, but there is actually a whole ton of diverse ethnic minorities, more so than Hong Kong. There are 52 recognized ethnic minority groups in China with their own dialects, own uh, traditions and outfits and, and looks. Uh, they're all uh, very, very different from the north to the south. When you talk about diversity in, in China, they actually think about diversity within China because in itself is diverse enough. In terms of religion, uh, it is uh, supposed to be a sectarian country. Um, however, there is a lot of Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Confucianism in terms of respecting your elders, strong kind of uh, family mindset. And there is Christianity and Islam that exists in China, but uh, very discreetly um, in existence. In terms of um, the languages spoken, uh, Mandarin is the, ba is the main one. I, as I mentioned earlier, it's different to Cantonese. Uh, in terms of the population, it has an increasingly um, strong uh, Gen Y or increasingly uh, vocal Gen Y population. Um, that are becoming more educated, more westernized, and, and thinking more in terms of less, less the traditional views, but thinking more kind of globally. So that's interesting to see. For women on boards, you'll be surprised to see it's 10.7%. That's very low. That's because we, there is no visibility of data. They don't release any data, so we can't measure. We can only assume that they, have, they are doing well, which is what they're saying uh, quite often. Um, and that figures from 2013. Okay, next slide. For uh, China, when it comes to LGBT, it's not illegal. Uh, there is a silent prejudice, and you'll be interested to know that there is pride events happening all across China. I attended a few this year. Uh, they exist in Shanghai, in Guangzhou, Shenzhen, uh, even in Tianjin, uh, even in Xiamen, all across China but it's again, very low key and you really need to get to know the locals and follow local media to know more about these events. There is a new intercompany LGBT network that was set up this year. Uh, Out and Equal came to Shanghai, uh, partnered with Community Business and held some business roundtables. Uh, that was um, attended by over 50 companies. Uh, majority, majority of them were actually global companies um, examples were Dow Chemical, GE, Dell, uh, GSK, Disney, you know, those were amongst the companies there. In terms of women, gender, uh, lack of official data for workforce statistics, there is this assumption that women are doing really well, there are a lot of women. When you look at the percentages in senior leaders and visibility, there really actually isn't that much there. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, for mothers, for working parents, very good policies uh, in companies, actually much better um, 
than um, a lot of companies in the US uh, with maternity leave um, going up anywhere from four to six months. Um, in terms of marriage leave, they give that, they give childcare leave, um, and uh, they do encourage the, both the mum and the father also to take this. Um, for culture, uh, it's a, a, a perceived as a homogenous society. Um, there is a, a lack of representation of ethnic minorities and a lack of acceptance and inclusion of ethnic minorities um, in the workforce and by businesses. Um, there is an elitist view of tier one cities, so Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou are seen as tier one cities. And if you're from there, if you have accent from there, you have better access to education, to job opportunities and building of relationships. Disability, there is a quota system for disability in, in China, um, but there is a lack of support and visibility of people with disabilities. International Labour Organization has set up a disability network. Okay. And next one, Japan. Now, Japan, um, the, uh, the interesting thing here is that um, there is actually ethnic minorities that exist within Japan. Um, but they, they are, you know, Korean, Chinese, but also indigenous uh, population in Japan. Uh, but there really isn't much um, spoken about the minority groups. The majority is Japanese, the language is Japanese. Um, there isn't much integration of other languages or dialects that exist within the country. Uh, in terms of the uh, population, they have a high um, older population, medium population, and a very small uh, Gen Y population compared to others as well as Gen Z. And that's because the fertility rate uh, is actually quite low and they have a declining population seven years consecutively. Uh, for women in the workforce, there's good participation, but the percentage of women on boards is only at 5.3%. I think two years ago in our report, it was just 1.5%. Next slide, please. In terms of LGBT, it's not illegal, fantastic. Several municipalities such as, you know, Tokyo, Osaka, those kind of places um, give same-sex partner rights, things like housing rights, uh, medical uh, insurance rights, hospital visitation rights, those kind of things. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of support from government, there are openly gay politicians. Uh, there's also a new think tank, and there's also um, uh, businesses doing a lot of work and an LGBT index by Work With Pride. In terms of gender, uh, the, uh, there are a lot of laws being put in place to advance women in the workplace because of the lack of women in senior leadership, of the lack of women in management, let alone senior leadership, um, such as gender reporting and the Advancing Women in the Workplace Act that came into force last year. Also, they're trying to increase um, maternity and paternity leave and um, support to encourage more, um, pair, uh, more couples to have children as well. Uh, however, there was a recent scandal, I don't know if anyone's heard about this, but Tokyo Medical University was found to deliberately mark down female students in their examinations so as to give the male students more opportunity to get a place, to keep, I think it's a 70-30 ratio. And so then it, it's now going into a full national scale uh, nationwide um, investigation to see how many other universities are also doing this. Um, culture, uh, that one there, they're basically they understand that with the uh, 2020 Olympics coming, there's a lot of um, information in the media about them wanting to build the English language capability and be more diverse and inclusive and um, integrate globally. Um, in terms of disability, there is a quota system. Uh, and uh, even though there is a quota system, there is a strong stigma that still prevails. Uh, and you don't really have visibility of the disability community, much like in China um, and in Hong Kong, the majority do tr tend to stay at home, uh, taken care of by their family. 
there was a recent employee data scandal where it was found that there was fraudulent data on the hiring of persons with disabilities found by quite a large number of companies um, which was exposed. Okay, next slide, Singapore. Singapore, I'll just be quick because I'm conscious of time. Um, Singapore has um, four nationally recognized ethnicity, ethnic groups as well as languages. So they are, uh, it is Malay, um, Chinese, um, the um, Westerners, uh, and, uh, and the um, Indian communities. And so that is reflected in the languages, English, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil. And so uh, it's a very diverse country uh, with uh, a, a strong commitment to cultural integration, racial integration, and racial harmony, um, ethnic, mi ethnic minority integration, and celebration of all kinds of religions. So you have all kinds of temples and religious institutions that are often side by side. Um, in terms of uh, participation of the workforce, women are doing well at 50%. Women on boards is currently at 12.9%, but um, it's actually going to be increasing because of strong government support to shape more female leaders. Next slide, please. You, in terms of um, gender, I just want to start with gender because we're, on, we're going on a high here for Singapore. And they're doing a lot of great things. Uh, they have mandatory paternity leave that's at two weeks now since 2017. Maternity leave is now 16 weeks and actually part of that can be taken by the father. So it's shifting towards parental leave. Um, and uh, in terms of women on boards, it's likely going to increase and, ex and uh, exceed um, Hong Kong. So they're going to take, take over Hong Kong. So that's fantastic. Um, however, it's not all rosy. LGBT, homosexuality is illegal. That is relating to um, um, male um, uh, couples in terms of the homosexual acts under section 377, uh, which is a, a terrible colonial law that still exists. Um, not actively enforced, but it's there. Um, there is a, an annual LGBT festival called Pink Dot. Um, which you can Google and is fantastic. Just Google Pink Dot Singapore. There are loads of company support and sponsorship, like Google and and uh, and and Goldman Sachs were all like sponsoring it. But then uh, two years ago, they said, "Okay, foreign companies cannot get involved. No more sponsorship." So um, they they literally, you know, banned sponsorship and also banned. Um, people that were not permanent residents or citizens to even attend the event, which um, was terrible. However, the India decision, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, has renewed motivation for LGBT rights. Okay, um, government is also supporting uh, disability by having an enabling village set up. Fantastic, so it's like a, a whole area has been built by the government to help support um, uh, people with disabilities from childhood through to adulthood, such as having additional courses, education, facilities, um, and that's all being done by the government. Okay, next slide. In terms of the population, um, I noticed that people are more interested in the Asian talent segment. So I'll leave you to have a look at um, India um, and um, I'll move on to the next slide, please, Ben. In terms of uh, LGBT, just so you know, uh, Section 377 was overturned in 2009, reinstated in 2013, which is terrible because all these people came out of the closet, but then now it's overturned again, so it's now decriminalized in 2018, so hooray, um, that's a big win, and there's so much talk right now about LGBT inclusion in India, it's crazy, we might be launching an LGBT index there soon, um, which is really great to see. Um, in terms of um, gender, um, there is this mandatory requirement to have one woman on board. Uh, there is extension of maternity leave up to 26 weeks, which is fantastic. And there's also laws in supporting women. There are also laws in supporting people with disabilities um, with a quota system. Uh, and also in terms of culture, again, like China, there is this dynamic of tier one, two and three cities 
country is huge. There's so many different provinces. And from north to south, there are so many different diversities. So like China, when you're from India, it's not about, okay, you're Indian. It's about where in India are you from? You know, what kind of, uh, um, what kind of um, language you speak even, because it's not all, not everyone speaks uh, Hindi in India. There is also other, uh, like Urdu as well, uh, and uh, and many other different um, dialects and that exists in India. Okay, next slide. Philippines. So this is Philippines. Um, this is some key diversity demographics that we have here. Um, the main population you can hear, see here really is the Gen Y and Gen Zs there at the bottom in a huge pyramid style. That makes it quite different to the um, to uh, Hong Kong. Uh, China and Japan are quite similar to India actually. India and Philippines both have a very heavy Gen Y population. Next slide. In terms of key DNI uh, dynamics, these are some key points here. Again, in terms of um, these key points, I don't have time to go through this. I'll need to talk about Asia talent. So um, I'm happy to give you a copy of our DNI country overview for Philippines for those that are interested. Okay, now we are going into the next slide, please. Um, barriers when it comes to DNI in Asia. Now I'm conscious of time. And I think I'll just do a very quick one. So for China, next slide. When you are looking at diversity inclusion, and if you're trying to talk to your Chinese colleagues, most of the time they're, they're thinking it's a Western concept. Um, it's not really relevant to us, you know, we, it's more a Westerners thing. Um, and actually most people in our surveys, they say that our organizations are diverse enough. You know, actually we're hundred percent inclusive. Um, however, when you dive deeper into that, when you look into um, diversity inclusion and opportunities for the minority groups, um, it's actually not that clear don't really know what unconscious bias is, don't really understand the concept of having different minority groups and why they need to be included. Um, and actually, you know, biases can be a good thing. 35% um, believe that uh, biases might hinder their own personal uh, career progression. However, 12% prefer not to say. Now for Hong Kong, next slide. In terms of the insider-outsider groups, which is very toxic for um, implementing diversity inclusion, it's interesting here that expats, uh, and quite often we're talking about Western expats, are seen as in the inside group, whereas local Hong Kong people see themselves as in the outsider group, as well as Southeast Asians, those that can't speak English very well, and introverts. And so the, there are key traits here that um, people assume mean that they'll put you in the insider group, which might not necessarily be your qualities. And when it comes to well presented and dressed, again, the mindset really is the Western perception of well dressed and, and presented, such as in a suit and tie, um, uh, that kind of mindset. And there are a lot of unconscious biases uh, that are apparent relating to culture, race, ethnicity. There's that exists, uh, racism does exist in Hong Kong. Um, and um, in terms of um, in terms of relationship and networks, that's a big thing, similar to China. Next slide, Japan. So for Japan, if you're in the inside group, it's about having professional appearance. It's about um, you know being an extrovert, rather introverts are similar to Hong Kong. Um, the need for a neutral accent. Uh, not having provincial accents uh, may seem may make you seem uh, less intellectual, um, less global. Also, um, men, <laughs> an interesting one. Um, there is this that if you're a man, you're inside. If you're a woman, actually, you are at a disadvantage. And if you look at the statistics that I showed to you earlier, you you can't you know you can see why. Uh, and also there's a strong assumption that women should take care of the family, even if they have a job. Um, so a lot of companies really need to be thinking about childcare support and, and um, making provisions like flexible working to help support these women that are stuck in these roles. Um, and then the unconscious biases there, as you can see, uh, it's um, very similar 
uh, to Hong Kong and China about your language, your dialect, if you have an accent, um, if you're a particular race or ethnicity or minority. Uh, these are all things that are important and also your gender can also cause biases. Next slide. India. India again, men was top. So it's like if you're a man then you have that inside advantage. If you're a woman actually you are disadvantaged. Um, also in terms of English language, if you have better English language you're perceived as more intel intelligent and have given more opportunities. Um, It looks like, oh, I think I've swapped, I think I've swapped the India and Japan one around. Ah, oh, sorry guys, okay, um, skip this, and I, <laughs> let's move on to the next one, and I'll give you the, um, I'll give you a copy of this research so you can look at the full picture. Okay, Singapore, now for Singapore, uh, inside a group, actually this is really interesting here, um, if you're local, if you're a Singaporean, you're seen as in the inside group. Um, also, if you're a Westerner, if you're a Western expat, expat you have that higher status, um, then you are also seen as an inside group. However, if you are kind of second tier expats, like from the, around the region, or if you are um, Indian or Muslim population, you're seen as outsider group. So there is this racism. Um, uh, that is geared towards these populations um, and also in terms of men and women again they have that as well if you're a man you're also seen as in, in the inside group and women again you have um, family responsibilities there um, that is something that is changing though um, but it does exist and similarly for unconscious biases they tend to be if you're local or not local um, in terms of your culture, race and ethnicity, even though the Singapore government have been harping on for many years about racial harmony, integration and inclusion, it does pose as issues when it comes to the workplace. And you can see segregated, segregated groups um, that the employees tend to hang out with, you know, Chinese tend to hang out with their fellow Chinese, Indian population might hang out with the fellow Indian populations and there still seems to be the segregation there in the business environment and also in your relationships and networks that also exists as well. Okay, now moving on to the next section is talking about developing Asian talent. Next slide. So what is required when you're looking at developing Asian talent? Well, actually uh, you know you have to appreciate the different cultural nuances that's why I wanted to talk to you about you know the diversity of Asia and then talk about the biases and differences that can exist between the markets before talking about Asian talent there is so much to learn when it comes to looking at Asia and Asian talent and it's about understanding all of these different things having that education and understanding the local market context in order to build your strategy and business case around this. Okay, now next slide. In terms of um, looking at Asian talent, we have this publication called Adopting an Asian Lens to Talent Development, looking at things like communication style, um, and in Asia, things like the concept of face, um, the concept of having trust and building relationships, so some of us may be familiar with the Hofstede uh, cultural assessment, Glow Spot assessment. You can see here that actually when it comes to Western profiles like US or UK, they tend to be more to the left looking at independent, egalitarian, risk, direct or task. Whereas Asian profiles tend to be more to the right. So they're more interdependent, more about status. Uh, there's more restraint rather than taking risks. Uh, communications and approaches might be more indirect. And then also in terms of um, the person, it might be more valuing relationships and focusing on the team rather than task and individual participation. So that's something that has come up. And when it comes to Asian talent in the region, how do they look at um, global companies coming in um, to develop Asian talent? You know, how do they think, so your colleagues in Asia, how do they see their opportunities and their value in a global company? Well, I've plucked three 
different markets to share with you some of the information. Next slide. So this is plucked from our Bringing Out the Best in Asian Talent publication. And in terms of, um, in terms of uh, companies, a lot more companies are now trying to build out programs, initiatives on developing um, Asian talent pipeline because there is this understanding of the need for greater Asian leadership um, because of shifting market dynamics and the corporate challenge of, of keeping and maintaining talent. In terms of uh, leaders' perspectives, uh, when working in MNCs in China, um, there are a lot of leaders that actually do get frustrated with the requirements and the assessment criteria for leadership that tends to be on a Western model, looking at key traits like assertiveness, like uh, in terms of um, speaking up, in terms of uh, transparency in the leadership, um, all of those things may not necessarily be traits that ch the Chinese um, use when they are leading. Um, they may not lead uh, as uh, in front of their team. They may actually be encouraging their team uh, and then they take a bit of a back seat or they are quiet leaders uh, or uh, perhaps uh, they work a lot on relationships on Guanxi, which is hard to show transparency when it comes to um, business practices. So these things uh, were raised as issues. Um, and also in terms of things like having to westernize their approaches and, and be able to mingle with um, the uh, global HQ and taking on things like um, uh, uh, the uh, Western outfits and things like that, um, adapting themselves to be more Western in order to get up higher up to the to leadership levels. In terms of graduates, what do the graduates things and the the um, the uh, younger generation? Well, we did a survey of university students, and it's interesting to see that for global MNCs, um, they see that as um, offering good salary and benefits, but the least likely to provide good job security because they don't feel valued. Um, they feel that, you know, they're there to do the work, which is why work-life balance is, 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 at a, uh, is seen as a, a low as well. Um, and they also don't think that they'll get opportunities for leadership. They don't see those visible role models in the company, uh, the Asian faces up in leadership. So they, don't, they think that they have much better opportunities in local companies after they've had a few years experience in the global MNCs. Next slide. For uh, Hong Kong, um, the um, idea is that, again, a lot of students want to work for a multinational company. 63% did. Uh, much more so than a local Hong Kong pump company. However, these statistics for the graduates is the same as um, China in that they, they have the exact same figures um, for uh, looking at um, uh, lack of work-life balance, a lot of hard work, no leadership potential, uh, no job security, uh, but they get some good experiences out of it. And so there is that lack of trust and and um, future seen by the, uh, the younger generation coming in. Um, and then in terms of uh, the leaders, they also have this difficulty in integrating into Western, uh, Western leadership ideals. Uh, when we interviewed some senior leaders, there was one that mentioned how they had to learn more about red wine, more about um, cheeses. <laughs> um, so it was a way to fit in. Uh, when um, going to the leadership meetings, um, trying to um, practice their English so that they could uh, come across as more fluent because if they do speak with an accent, they did feel that they were left out or treated as slightly uh, dumber than other people, which is which shouldn't be the case. Um, and so those, those are some issues um, when looking at Asian talent from a junior and senior level and why there is that struggle to get them into the global level. Next slide. Um, for India, 
Um, again, it's similar, as you can see here, to both China and Hong Kong in the perspectives. So this is a trend uh, across the, the, the different markets where it's great for money, great for benefits, great for having international opportunities, overseas assignments. Um, even though all of them recognize that there is a clear path for advancement, um, they don't really trust it and they just still don't think that they will get opportunities to rise through the ranks to leadership and would much rather try their chances in local companies after getting a few years experience. And you can see here that um, uh, one of the quotes from one of these university students that reiterate the sentiment. Again, for senior leaders, they have the same issues as the Hong Kong and the Chinese in terms of having to be more westernized. One, one senior leader mentioned that um, they actually wore a sari to a, um, a, a global leader uh, business meeting and was told why they came in casual dress because they, their, the sari is actually you know, one of their, um, their national uh, outfits and can be worn uh, as, a, as, as, as a sign of, of much respect and professionalism. And so, you know, you have senior government, uh, government leaders wearing them. So for someone to say that, you know, was quite shocking to them. Uh, and uh, they felt, you know, in a way, uh, discriminated against and that they must be more Western in order to be seen as a true leader. Um, so there are comments like that that echo Hong Kong and Chinese sentiments. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, Linda, I haven't given you much time, but I just want to leave you with one thing. Next slide. And next slide again. Um, Goldman Sachs is one of our featured case studies here in Adopting an Asian Lens to Talent Development, where they came up with a cultural spectrum because they understood that actually, when you're looking at Asian talent, it's not just about local Asian talent. It's about all the different profiles and, and um, uh, diversities that can exist within uh, these different profiles. Like you might have someone that's local, local, which they identified as someone born and raised in the local market in Asia, for example, China, only ever worked in China, uh, speaks fluent Chinese, but uh, maybe a dialect um, that their English is a second language. But then you might have someone that is second generation, where they were born overseas. Ethnically, they may be Asian, but they don't have any affinity or, or um, or values that are shared with uh, Asian that is living in Asia. And so you have that profile as well. And then you have someone like myself. So I was born and raised in the UK with roots in, in Hong Kong, never visited Hong Kong or Asia, but then moving to Asia in my 20s to find a career here in, in, in Asia and to, to get kind of acquainted with these Asian cultures that were very alien to me as I was growing up. And on that note, I will pass it over to Linda, and I'm very sorry I didn't give you much time, but please uh, share a bit about the perspective. I'm so sorry. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. No, thank you for, um, that was great, and, and uh, it's no problem at all. Uh, just keep it short, because I and know that- Linda. Yes. We, we can run a little bit over. If folks can, can continue to join with us, we can certainly go an extra couple of minutes, five minutes or so, if you want. Okay. Okay, great. I, I will uh, try to keep it short. Um, ben, if you don't mind just scrolling forward, um, let me, before I, uh, actually, before I go to that slide, let me just tell you, uh, you could just leave it on that slide. Let me just, just a, a few comments, I, I think. Um, I think, uh, Flo, thank you very much. That was fabulous. And um, and I saw on the chat uh, box that a number of folks were interested in um, Asian uh, Asian talent here in the U.S. Uh, or in, in from, from my perspective, I, I'm going to say Asian Americans. And um, my involvement in this uh, started because of um, a, an outreach that I made to both Steve and, and then uh, by uh, by extension, then it became to flow. Um, but it's just this idea of um, the perceptions of Asians in the U.S. as being interchangeable with Asians in Asia. And um, 
And I think that that's a, a common uh, occurrence for someone like me who was born and raised here in the U.S., but oftentimes assumed to be, um, you know, someone who's from somewhere in Asia and asked often, uh, where am I from? And when I say I'm from California, then question, no, where am I really from? And then also at times complimented on my English as well, too. Um, so I wanted to just start with that because um, while I think there's a lot of commonalities that we have, especially in a lot of the profiles that Flo shared um, around some of the both um, attitudinal and cultural kind of profiles, um, I think there are certain nuances that I wanted to just highlight so that there is a distinction. And I think it's important to understand that in terms of when you think about who you're working with, particularly your Asian uh, American talent that are that are based here in the US, um, perhaps grew up here, born and raised here, um, or came over here um, either at an early age or even, even at a later age, but has spent a significant portion of their time here in the US. Um, so, so again, starting with the idea that um, Asians are not, uh, Asians and Asian Americans are not interchangeable. I think there is a, a distinct experience and nuance to that. And I think there often is this muddling that happens um, U.S.-based companies, particularly, or or leaders based in the U.S., I think, um, go to Asia. Um, I've observed sometimes that they they have this um, they have this understanding of of what Asians are supposed to be like because of their experiences with Asian Americans, but then find that maybe it's not always the same. And then on the other end, uh, experiences that they have with Asians in Asia become transferred to how they see Asians, uh, Asian Americans here in the US and particularly as foreigners. Um, I think there's some things to keep in mind. The slide that I wanna show you next um, is as you think about your Asian talent uh, here in the US, um, I'm showing you a slide that shows five major waves of immigration. And I think one of the, the ways that I always uh, uh, advise uh, folks about understanding Asians is understanding their what I call immigration generation to the US um, because I think depending on when a, a person and or their family you know whether it's a grandparent a great-grandparent or a mother or even themselves came to this country um, I believe that someone's values become frozen in time based on when they made the choice to um, to make their move and live here in the U.S. and and by that I mean um, if let's say you are working and you have a workforce that is let's say predominantly uh, American born, um, perhaps their families came, you know, four, five, six generations ago. It is not unheard of to find Asian Americans now who um, are sixth generation uh, Asian Americans. Um, that they're going to see things culturally as well as just um, from a perspective point of view in a very different way. Let's just say, for example, they're Chinese American. Their family members came, you know, at the turn of the 1800s, um, in the mid to early 1800s. Their perspective is going to be very different from, say, somebody who is of Chinese heritage, who perhaps their families came in the 60s, or they came over more recently in sometime like the late 90s, um, because culturally they've had an experience or their families come with an experience that is different than perhaps uh, some of the earlier waves of immigrants have had. So the first major wave is that uh, mid to late 1800 waves, you know, these could be Chinese, Japanese, uh, Korean, uh, Filipino, or Indian. Um, then the second wave is those who came in the 60s. Most of the people who came in that first wave came mostly for economic reasons. The second wave, most of the people who started coming over in the 60s came for more professional reasons or education reasons. They came over as scholars, as students, um, or as actual um, professionals which is a very different profile from the earlier wave of Asians who came. And, it's, and, and I mentioned that because um, the Asians who came in that first wave were seen as um, just uh, poorly educated, um, I'll just use the word low-class laborers, 
uh, with uh, with not a whole lot of skill level, and um, and then contrast that with the second wave in which um, we had a new group of Asians coming in with higher education, uh, greater skill levels from a professional point of view. Um, third major wave was in 1975 with the fall of Saigon. The people who came in this wave were mostly Southeast Asians from Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, um, and Hmong who were helping the CIA uh, in the secret war that was in Southeast Asia. They came as refugees, so their reasons for coming were very different. Most of them, um, again, were also farmers, perhaps laborers, and um, again, a different kind of profile than the previous wave um, of immigrate, immigrants that came, Asian immigrants that came in the 60s. Um, the fourth major wave, I would characterize it being in the 80s, and that is, um, you know, folks after the Chinese Cultural Revolution ended in the in 1979, we started to see big waves of mainland Chinese students coming over for education opportunities. So um, again, a different profile from the earlier waves of of Chinese immigrants who. Uh, came in the mid to late 1800s to help build the Transcontinental Railroad. And then in the late 90s, um, mid to late 90s with the dot-com boom, we started to see again another wave of immigrants from China, but also um, from India as well too. And uh, again, coming over as, as skilled professionals and uh, really changing the picture of the Asian community here in the US. And it, um, it's important to remember these kind of, keep in mind these kind of things because um, their attitudes for coming, their perspectives for, for being here um, are gonna be different because they bring over a different wave um, of, of perspective from those countries. I mentioned that values become frozen in time. So, Somebody who came in the mid to late 1800s, you know, they 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 grew up in in mid 1800s China. Um, somebody who came in the 60s um, also may have experienced something um, similar, maybe culturally, but still the country moves on, it evolves, and I think what we see is when you come to this country. Um, you're not surrounded by your culture around you like you were living in Asia, in your country of origin in Asia. And so a lot of times, most immigrants want to replicate what they have and pass on their, their cultural practices, their values to their, to their kids. And that gets passed on, uh, so on and so forth. And it's interesting because a lot of what people remember and pass on is based on what culture in their home country was like when they left. In the meantime, the rest of Asia evolves and continues to move on. Flo talked about a lot of the Gen Y millennials and how they've taken on a much more global perspective. And that's what we're seeing is some of the nuances in terms of Asian Americans and Asians. It's not that Asian Americans are frozen in time, but the cultural kind of, um, of nuances that get played out in workplaces based on what they were taught from their families. Um, does become a factor in, I think, how they see work, how they see um, their interactions with people, how they communicate with others as well, too. Um, lastly, I want to also mention one more distinction, or two more distinctions. One, um, I think another factor to keep in mind is where did your Asian talent grow up in the US? Um, if you grew up in the West Coast in a place like California, there's such a big population that you almost don't think about being Asian because it's not unusual. And so it becomes that, hey, we're just like everybody else. But if you grew up in a place like the South or the Midwest, where you may be the only Asian family, and you're constantly reminded about what, what and who you are, um, there's a different kind of mindset and I think attitude that also comes with that as well, too. And these are nuances that I think play into what I call a uniquely Asian American experience. And the last thing I want to mention is that Flo talked about very specifically about um, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, the Philippines, India, Japan. Um, there's even places like Korea and, of course, you know, um, uh, Vietnam. Um, in the U.S., we often use the more broader term Asian, even though in, within the community, we will talk within very ethnic specific terms. But in the US, we do talk about Asians in the aggregate, mostly because our population numbers um, would be way too small and be rendered statistically insignificant. And 
we all know the numbers talk. And so the way in which we've had to really be able to gain the kind of attention and at least um, um, some level of, of um, you know, attention is to be able to be seen in the aggregate. Although there are very distinct nuances amongst the different Asian ethnic groups here in the US. And a lot of what Flo talked about, um, similarly in terms of Southeast Asians uh, here in the US, uh, we see that there's a range of different um, attitudes, economic circumstances that also um, can play out in terms of who you see uh, you know, uh, as Asian talent in your workplaces. Um, so I'll stop there. I know that that was a really quick overview, um, but if there's any questions, I'm, um, you know, I, I'd be happy to entertain any questions afterwards. Um, so there is one question uh, from Leticia, and she's asking, where can I get more information on leadership development organizations for Asian talent? Who can I connect with for more discussion on best practices around developing Asian and Asian American talent? And I would say, depending on whether you're looking at Asians in Asia or Asians in the US, it would depend. So if you're looking for Asians in Asia, you can contact Flo at Community Business. If you're looking for Asians in the US, you can contact uh, Linda at Leap uh, because they are both experts in this space um, and specific to the continent that they happen to be based on. Uh, and we'll obviously have their contact information on our website uh, once the uh, webinar is over. That'll show up, in fact, here it is showing up as a slide here. It'll be part of the slides that will be uh, uh, provided uh, at the end, uh, once we get them all up, uh, once the webinar is over. So that's, that's where you can get that information. These are amazing organizations. Uh, we've been working with both of them for a, a number of years and I'm really happy to have them both represented in today's webinar. Uh, there was another, let's see, I'm not sure if it's a question or a statement from, oh, there's two, from Calvin Jackson in Florida. Hi, Calvin. Uh, should we try and impact erroneously aggregating all Asians by using maybe Asian Pacific Islander or South Asians or even Baltics? So he's asking a question about how, 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 how can we refer to people to get a little more handle on the specificity of where they're from uh, and how that might impact their culture. Um, and they're actually just a statement, it looks like from Sarah. This has been a fascinating look at information around the Asian experience and it'd be great to learn more. Have a webinar that builds on this knowledge. So that's a challenge for us for next year for uh, uh, finding another uh, a webinar to, uh, to uh, uh, grill, uh, drill down on, on, on more of this information. Uh, does any, um, thank you, Leticia, for your thank you. Uh, does anyone want, want to answer, I guess this would be for Linda, uh, Calvin's question about um, maybe disaggregating a bit? Uh. Sure, sure. Um, so actually, um, I'll just say that, uh, you know, this is part of the kind of the, 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 the challenge of being Asian and, uh, you know, Asian American here in the US. I mean, there's a number of terms that we all use for various reasons. I think, um, I think it depends, Calvin, on um, who you're talking about. I think you are seeing more moves in which particularly um, Southeast Asian and South Asian communities are increasingly asking to be referred to specifically um, in uh, a more, a little bit more regional specific kind of term in terms of using like Southeast Asian or South Asian. Um, I think it depends on the context to be honest. Um, for LEAP, what we use is the term Asian and Pacific Islander, although um, there are times when I'll use uh, a term like Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander because there are distinct uh, differences between those groups. There's also another term that's being used increasingly more, which is Arab, Middle Eastern, uh, South Asian uh, communities, or AMESA, uh, you'll, you'll see. And so I think it, it just depends on, on who you are working with and um, you know, uh, what the purpose is. But, but um, again, it goes back to why I said that I, you, you know, we're using the term Asian in aggregate here in the US. Um, you know, one, it's a census number, but it's also um, the reality is that if we were to disaggregate and be known specifically by Chinese, Indian, Filipino, Japanese, Vietnamese, Korean, um, then we would, other than, Chinese and Indian communities, um, everybody else would be rendered, you know, so in statistically insignificant, we would not even 
be on anyone's radar screens. And even the South Asian or Indian and Chinese populations only hit at about one or two percent. And so they too would also not get a lot of traction in terms of, you know, that kind of, of attention that numbers render. Yeah, and just to jump in there, Linda, on the data perspective, if you're trying to, because your Asian populations are not so uh, significant in the US, uh, you can't really try to whittle it down. Uh, but however, in terms of representation and visibility and recognition of these different groups, they would greatly appreciate it. If you can at least break it down to North Asian, East Asian, uh, Southeast Asian and South Asian to at least give them the opportunity to talk about perhaps their culture, their sharing um, of uh, uh, country, people from countries or um, of cultures from those different subsections within Asia. So I guess it's the different contexts. You know, how do you celebrate your Asian talent by recognizing the diversity, but at the same time, how can you get traction and get the data and statistics needed um, which, as Linda said, you know, if it's only one or two percent, you need to have it as a, the Asian group. And that can be the case for an Asian ERG, which I understand a lot of US companies have an Asian ERG, which in Asia would baffle us because that's just, that's just everything. Um, so um, I think there's some more questions down below. Some more. No, just yeah. thank you. No, they're okay. mostly they're, they're just thank you. How do we get a copy of the corrected slides? Those are the ones we will post on the website for Cheryl yeah. and for everybody else. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Flo will flip, um, flip those out between uh, the two countries and uh, send those to us and then we'll get them posted uh, as well as the recording, which will probably be next week sometime, so that you can listen to it again and watch the slides again, uh, as well as their contact information, all that will be on the website. So. Thank you all for uh, staying on. We have almost almost everybody who joined the webinar today is still on the webinar. I appreciate that a great deal. Um, and a great deal of thanks to Florence and Linda. It was 11 o'clock at night in, in Hong Kong when Florence started the webinar and 7 a.m. for Linda in, in the, in the, on the West Coast. So uh, a great deal of thank you to them for early and late um, um, uh, participation. Uh, and also thank you, of course, to our webinar sponsor, Aon. Uh, the SHRM activity codes we put up on the, um, uh, uh, up on the uh, chat box a bit ago. So if you wanna keep scrolling on that, you can find those. Um, but I'll call them out as well. For SHRM, it's 18-JPG9W. And for HRCI, it's 37 four zero one nine um, we are currently solidifying our 2019 webinar series we've got one that we're waiting on to be able to uh, schedule the January webinar um, several of the others are already scheduled we'll be getting that um, information up on our website as soon as we get them confirmed um, uh, you can visit our website, of course, at forum on workplaceinclusion.org. We're also on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, and use the search forum on workplace inclusion. And of course, don't forget that we have a major event coming up in April the 16th through the 18th of April at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion Conference here in Minneapolis. Uh, we have confirmed our speakers. And I actually haven't counted recently. I know we had 199 speakers last year. Uh, and, and Linda was there last year. Lawrence was there last year. And I hope that uh, you all will be there as well. Uh, I certainly recognize many of your names on the webinar. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in April. Uh, and of course, on our webinar in January, as soon as we know which one it is. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Florence, go to bed. Say hi to your husband <laughs> for me. Uh, Linda. <laughs> Start your day, which you've already done, but um, uh, everyone have a, have a great day and a great Thank holiday season. Much. Happy holidays. Thank you. And thanks, Linda. Thank you very much. Thank Happy you, Flo, too. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat>